There has been a great deal of confusion, discussion, and activity recently, all directed toward figuring out who the governor of West Virginia is. I'm Dan Ringer, and we'll talk about replacing Governor Manchin right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. The Law Works is made possible by the generous support of the West Virginia State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system. One might think that if our state's governor resigns, there's a procedure in place to replace him. Well, not so fast. My guest is West Virginia University law professor Robert Bastris. Bob, uh, we asked you to come do this because you're a bit of an expert on the West Virginia Constitution, and that seems to be wrapped up in all of this. How did we, how did we come to this position? Don't we know how to replace a governor? Well, we came to this position, of course, because uh, Senator Man or Governor, now Senator, gov then Governor Manchin resigned to become Senator Manchin and leaving a vacancy. And according to our Constitution, when a vacancy occurs in the office of governor, um, the Senate president shall act as governor. Let me, let me read that okay. constitutional provision because of the, it's interesting in its detail. It's fairly lengthy. In the case of the death conviction or impeachment, failure to qualify, resignation, or other disability of the governor, the president of the Senate shall act as governor until the vacancy is filled or the disability removed. And if the, pre Senate, if the president of the Senate for any of the above named causes shall be incapable of performing the duties, the same shall devolve upon the Speaker of the House of Delegates. So we do have some uh, backup. backup. And in all other cases where there's no one to act as governor, one shall be chosen by joint vote of the legislature, in case those two people are not able to. Whenever a vacancy shall occur in the office of governor before the first three years of the term shall have expired, a new election for governor shall take place to fill the vacancy. And that last sentence is important because the Supreme Court has right. looked at that very closely. Again, whenever a vacancy shall occur in the office of governor before the first three years of the term shall have expired, a new election for governor shall take place to fill the vacancy. But the devil is in the details. Right. Well, and uh, of course, there was a recent Supreme Court decision interpreting that provision, and the, um, the court really came down on that last sentence you read, uh, that if a vacancy occurs in the first three years, uh, then a, a, a new election shall be, uh, shall be held to, so that the people can fill the office of governor. And I think that was an important part of it. I mean, there are a lot of things that come into play in interpreting Section 16, but I think that that, that three-year clause doesn't make any sense if you don't have a special election during that three-year period, when the vacancy occurs during that three-year period. And, and it quite clearly favors the... Uh, uh, filling the vacancy by a vote of the people of the entire state. And I think that's, that was the core of the Supreme Court's opinion, and I think it was quite correct. Um, and particularly true is when you compare um, that what you were reading was Article 7, Section 16 of the 1872 Constitution, and when you compare that provision to the 60, 1863 Constitution, the difference is quite striking and explains, and, and I think you can derive from that, the inference that what they really intended was that the Senate president would only act for a limited period of time. West Virginia became a state in 1863. Right. A constitution was adopted at that time. Right. And then amended, refined, readopted later. Right. In 1872. And the 63 provision looked very much like the last Virginia constitution. Uh, the last Virginia constitution said that the if a vacancy occurs in the office of governor, then the duties, compensations, and responsibilities shall devolve upon the lieutenant governor, of the office shall devolve upon the lieutenant governor. And the 63 Constitution, they didn't want a lieutenant governor. They just said that that's a, that's a bauble. 
uh, and we're not going to pay for it. So, but they still had that the provision uh, that the duties, compensation, and responsibilities shall devolve upon the Senate president. And quite clearly, the Senate president was to become governor. He would resign as Senate president and become governor. And what happened shortly before the 1872 Constitution, somewhere around 1870, Arthur Borman was governor and was elected to be senator by the state legislature, which is how they did it then. And he was then governor, and he resigned um, to become senator. But there was only one week left in the office, and the, it was only two-year terms at the time as well. And the Senate president took over as governor for six days or seven days, whatever it was, and he didn't resign as Senate president. And so we had this really critical separation of powers issue for a week there. And so the 72 framers, I think, wanted to avoid that, and so they just said the Senate president would act as governor until we can fill it by election. That avoided the separation of powers issue? Uh, not very well. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope you heard the sarcasm uh, in that. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably they thought it would be a, a short enough period of time that would just be a sort of um, uh, an exception to the separation of powers issues. Because there is a, a, an explicit provision in, in Article 5 of the Constitution that says you can't serve in two different branches at the same time. And, and that's obviously, um, it's, it's Section 16 is obviously a qualification to that. In both the federal and the West Virginia state constitutions, the concept of separation of powers is, is very strong. And by that, we mean we have three branches of governor, government, the executive, which is the governor, the judicial, which is the courts, most of the courts at least, and the legislative, uh, which is the state senate and the House of Delegates in West Virginia. And the separation of powers is essentially an absolute. The, one branch does not interfere with the others. The legislature makes the laws, the uh, courts apply and sometimes interpret the laws, and the executive uh, applies the laws. And so we say now the executive does what the executive does, the legislative does what the legislative does, the judicial does what the judicial does, and we, we're not going to mix them up, except in this case. Well, ex except as explicit, ex uh, expressly provided in the Constitution. Um, and obviously, uh, Section 16 is, is an example. And of course, the, there are other examples, too. Um, the, the, the legislature uh, tries uh, impeachment cases, um, so it acts as a judicial body in that context. The House impeaches and the Senate tries. Um, and of course, the governor participates in lawmaking in the sense that he introduces bills, and he also has the capacity to, to veto them. So, that, I mean, the, 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 the separation of powers is, is more a distribution of powers uh, and, and ex as expressly provided in the Constitution. And in this case, we have a legislator, the Senate president, who assumes to some regard the mantle of the governor. Right. But and, what does that mean? Well. <laughs> You can interpret that in different ways. Uh, the way in which uh, <coughs> Acting Governor Tomlin has interpreted it is that he basically steps up and performs the, the duties of, of governor and, and, and basically takes over the office. Um, and, and he has um, executed that by saying, I'm going to sort of distance myself from my role as Senate president and, and I'm not going to ass assume those duties. Uh, I will act only as governor for this period of time. And that may not have been what they contemplated in 1872, but on the other hand, you know, you could understand uh, uh, Governor Tomlin taking that position because the office has grown so much. I mean, in 1872, there might not have been that much to do, frankly, as governor, uh, especially when the legislature wasn't in session. And, uh, I mean, it was still an important office for the state, but today it's, it's, it's just a, a much more complex and burdensome uh, job. It would be difficult to, to continue as Senate president and uh, do all that's required of a governor these days. It's not just simply a matter of whoever's serving as governor saying, I've got to stop by the office and sign a few bills today, and then I'll go back to my real job. The governor works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, right. It, it, it's, it's a demanding job. And I think 
it would tax the state if we didn't have a full-time governor. So the Senate president acts as governor. Now, there's, there's no provision for an acting governor in the law by that title. Right. There, nowhere is that term used. The, the Senate president shall act as governor, but there's the, the term acting governor does not appear. But the job of Senate president is not a part-time job either. I mean, we, we talk about that's having... That's also true. We, we talk about having a part-time legislature, but that's more true in the pronouncement in, that, rather than in the fact. Oh, trust me. In fact, <laughs> yeah, Professor Bastrus's wife, uh, Barbara Fleischauer, is a member of the West Virginia House of Delegates also. So you see that. Yes, yes. And, and, and certainly in the leadership, um, the, the demands on their time is, are, are, are enormous. So when Senate President Tomlin begins to act as governor, what happens to his duties as Senate president? Well, you know, we're all in uncharted areas here because uh, this is the first vacancy we've had since 1869 or 1870. Um, so we're sort of, not we, the legislature and, and Governor Tomlin are sort of making this up as they go, and I don't mean that derogatively. Um, what's occurred, of course, is that the Senate changed its rules to create the office of acting Senate president. So we now have an acting governor and an acting Senate president uh, who was uh, newly elected uh, at the start of this legislative term. We're talking about replacing West Virginia Governor Joe Manchin. My guest is West Virginia University law professor Robert Bastris. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Well, there's some dispute about the Senate's ability to change its own rules? Uh, I don't, not in my mind. Um, there's a specific provision in our state constitution in Article 6 which says that each house shall have the authority to make its own rules and elect its own leaders, etc. And that's all that the Senate did. It changed its rules pursuant to Article 6. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't find any statutes, uh, certainly not in the Constitution. Is there any description about how the Senate has to tend to its own business, except that it has to tend to its own business? Right, right. You just, you, majority rules. So they picked uh, Senator Jeff Kessler yes. to serve as acting Senate president, so he provides, presides over the Senate. He's, yes, he is. Replacing, in essence, Senator Tomlin who was in that position right, formally. Right, right. As so, I mentioned, Governor Tomlin decided that he would not continue in both roles, uh, that he would, he's still Senate president because otherwise he couldn't be acting governor, but... Uh, and, and that was a question when the legislature convened also. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, but um, uh, I, and I think quite statesmanlike, uh, he uh, decided that uh, it was not a good thing for him to be performing the duties of Senate president while he was performing the duties as acting governor. I interpret that, interpreted that as kind of a nod toward the separation of powers document. I, that, yes. That I'm even sure. though he was a legislator, he, did, he removed himself as much as he could from that role so that there was no obvious conflict right. between the two. Right. So how long is uh, Governor Tomlin going to be Governor Tomlin? Um, well, uh, he could be governor for... I mean, I, I don't know that. It depends. Let's obviously. say without further action. Okay. Uh, well, of course, the Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that Section 16 required a special election if the vacancy occurs within the first three years, and uh, construing the statute uh, in, which provided for special elections to be issued by a proclamation from the governor, the Supreme Court said the governor had a mandatory duty to issue a proclama proclamation for a special election. He has done that. Uh, and set it for uh, next October, and uh, and the statute in place at the t at the moment provides for nominations to be made by convention, um, and so I, I'm sh there is legislation pending, uh, and I'm sure there will be cer certainly a serious consideration made about changing that. Okay, there is great debate about whether it should be. There, whether there should be a primary or whether there should be a convention. The current statute, the statutes are what we typically refer to as laws. The Constitution is law too. It's the big law. It's, it's the supreme, overriding law, right. the supreme law. And then to en enact the provisions of the Constitution, the legislature passes 
statutes, uh, which is what we usually refer to as laws. And the statute currently in place says the political parties will have conventions to pick right. candidates for governor in this special or in the special election. But who are the political parties? Well, at present, uh, well, that's a problem, too. Uh, the current law doesn't really provide for a mechanism for other for, for nominations by other than the major parties. Um, one could make the argument that the laws relating to petitioning to get on the ballot in with regards to our typical general elections might apply, but it, it, it's, it's, if there are third parties out there who want to participate in this election, uh, they might be able to claim that that law is unconstitutional for its failure to provide for their participation. Um, and of course, the, the current parties in West Virginia entitled to be on the ballot are the Democratic, Republican, and Mountain parties. And, and you know, to be honest, um, to nominate the major party candidates by convention in this year would be a circus, <laughs> uh, given how many people are vying for the spot. Well, uh, there are at least a lot of people who have expressed an interest right. in doing this, including apparently the Secretary of State, who is the one who's responsible for certifying eligibility of candidates to be right. on the ballot. Right. That's Natalie Tennant. Right. Uh, at least among the published lists, I have seen several names from both parties right. who are interested. Now, in 1872, how many political parties were there? There were two, and uh, Republicans and Democrats, and I suspect there was never any serious thought given to the fact that there might be other political parties at some point. It was 1872, and things were the, as they were. Uh, yeah, in 72, there were third parties uh, throughout the 19th century. The, the know-nothings were... Uh, pretty active in the 1850s, and then you had the farmers and laborers and so on. In 1872 itself, I'm not sure there were any really active third parties. Uh, but the, you know, the, the Prohibition Party came on not too long after that. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, farmers and laborers. And so perhaps that's why the uh, statute is written to not specify political parties, but to just say political parties. Right. Well, yeah, uh, it could be that uh, the other political parties could nominate by convention as well. In West Virginia, to become a political party, to actually get your candidates on the ballot, what do you have to do? For the typical general election, you, um, if, if you're a political party, you automatically qualify. And to be a political party, you have to have received 1% of the vote in the preceding gubernatorial election. If you didn't do that, then you have to petition to get on the general election ballot, which requires uh, gathering signatures from at least 1% uh, of registered voters in equal in number to those who voted in the last election for that particular office. So you have to show by one mechanism or another that enough people are interested in your position to make it viable on the ballot, right, make it worthy of discussion. You have sufficient support to justify your, your presence on the ballot. But there's no discussion in the law about how these conventions are to be run, who is to attend them, any of that. There's a little bit in the statute, as I recall. I, I don't re remember the details, but it's pretty much up to the parties to, to uh, how they want to go about running these conventions. Hence the word circus. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't see how a convention could do that. I mean, the, 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 there is, there, each of the candidates actually have their own, ha, has a, each of the candidate, candidates have, have a base and in the party. And so it would, it would, the party would be quite splintered, I would think. We're talking about replacing West Virginia Governor Joe Manchin. My guest is West Virginia University law professor Robert Bastris. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Why was there a question, why was there a Supreme Court case about whether we needed to have a special election? Well, uh, Governor Tomlin took the position that um, we didn't need a special election because the statute, the statute in place, and it, it, it's, been, it's been modified in, in some details over time, but it's, it was, its basic form was initially enacted in 1875. 
uh, which was only three years after the, the Constitution had been adopted. And the statute provided, um, it, it, it's, it's a model of obfuscation, but if you work your way through it, um, it, it it's generally conceded that the statute did not require a special election. Uh, it was phrased as such that if a vacancy occurs in the, uh, in the office of governor, uh, then the office will be filled by the people at the next general election. Um, and the next general election after Governor Manchin resigned was November 2012, or is November 2012. And of course, Governor Tomlin was just applying the statute and saying, well, the statute says that we'll fill the vacancy at the next general election, so we'll fill it at, in 2012. The challengers to that statute claim that Section 16 required something quicker. Uh, and it had to be a special election because 2012 was too late. And, and if you think about it, uh, we'd have, under Governor Tomlin's reading, well, under the statute, uh, it was not an un unreasonable reading of the statute, under the statute we'd be running two gubernatorial elections in 2012 simultaneously, uh, one for the, two th for the vacancy and one for the, the next term which would begin only two months after the November election. So it was, it was a statute that, uh, that operated, frankly, in a quite stupid fashion. Uh, and so the, the Supreme Court case was the result of uh, people thinking that uh, Section 16 required something differently, different, and, and the Supreme Court agreed. It's interesting to see the list of entities, uh, because it's not all just people, it's, it's some organizations, that got involved in this lawsuit. Uh, the West Virginia Citizen Action Group mm -hmm. is involved, and they are basically a, uh, a, you might describe them as an activist group, they describe themselves as, as a group interested in better politics or better, better political process. Uh, it's a progressive group uh, that supports uh, <clears throat> better government, cleaner environment, and so forth. Thornton Cooper, who is a, a lawyer in Charleston as an individual, uh, the West Virginia AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. which is a labor union, uh, Glenn Gaynor, who is the auditor of West Virginia, Charles McElwee, who is an attorney in Charleston and an just an interested person who had some things he wanted to say, uh, the West Virginia Education Association got involved not as a party, but as someone who, again, had something to say. These are called amicus curiae uh, parties that, that you get permission from the Supreme Court in these cases to come in and voice your opinion. And sometimes you, you do get very good insight into what's going on. Uh, uh, Senator Tomlin, acting Governor sure. Tomlin, was a party to this. Uh, Richard Thompson, who is the Speaker of the House of Delegates, and Natalie Tennant, who is the Secretary of State. All, all of these people were involved in this case because things were be either, either being asked of them or because they had something to say about all this. So there was a, a lot of high-powered political and legal talent involved in this. For sure. And the Supreme Court voted how? The court decided that Section 16 required a, a special election when the vacancy occurs in the first three years. As it the, did of, here. Yes, of the term. And, uh, and, and therefore, reading this, the statute, which provided for a gubernatorial proclamation for a special election when, when one was needed, said the governor had to issue one. Um, and the, the court's reasoning was primarily relying on the three-year clause that uh, there wouldn't be any reason to have uh, the three-year provision if a, a special election wasn't contemplated during that time, and that um, the fact that one wasn't required during the, the last year created an inference that, that uh, a year was the maximum time that the uh, Senate president could, quote, act as governor. Was this a close vote, a divided court? In no, it was a unanimous this? decision. It was unanimous, and I, and I think it was, uh, reason, it was uh, it's a very well-crafted opinion and reach the right result in my mind. There seemed to be a note in the opinion that the court had some thought about this constitutional or about this convention process right. to pick candidates. Right. It pointed out that the statute provided for nomination by convention and that the legislature might want to consider an alternative procedure in amending the, that statute. It ought to amend the statute regardless. It's, 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 it's 
very poorly written. It's, it's kind of unusual that uh, the Supreme Court would say to the legislature, you might want to change this law. Well, they, they do that from time to time. But I, uh, I, I don't know that they can, the legislature can get consensus on what ought to be done within this legislative session or not. Actually, it's a fairly substantial change to do on short notice. Yes. And besides, everybody oh. likes to go to the circus. Yes, except, yeah, right. <laughs> except we, they, uh, they, meaning the legislators, uh, just did it. Um, I mean, we, we had the same situation when Senator Byrd died. And uh, they quickly put together a statute which provided for a special primary and a special general election. West Virginia University law professor Robert Bastris. Thanks, Bob, for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of The Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. On The Law Works webpage at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works program topics and additional information about this show's topic. If you would like to recommend this program to a friend, you'll find a video of the program at The Law Works website. You'll also find free video and podcasts of previous programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future program, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a free copy of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the West Virginia State Bar, the Mountain State Bar, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by the generous support of the West Virginia State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.